Our first scripture reading is from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of God. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they will not fear any longer, or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he, will, he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Open up your hymns, please, to In the Lord I'll Be Every Thankful. Number 448, we'll sing it through three times. Our second reading in this morning comes from the letter of Paul to the church in Colossus. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to, to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in Christ all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Did you have a good uh, Thanksgiving? Yeah? Um, I, I admit I spend a little time sometimes imagining what uh, different Thanksgivings might be like. I know Bob and Sue were posting pictures on Facebook of their Thanksgiving in California. I'm just very jealous of that. Um, I imagine maybe there was like a crafty centerpiece or maybe like place cards at Tanya's house. Um, I really wonder what kind of food the Tampoos Sorry that they're Thanksgiving. Like, is it a mix? Is it just all the foods? All the foods. All the foods. And I wonder, what's your table like? Is it big enough? In my house, we have this old hand-me-down table. It's pretty small, but you can add up to three leaves in it, right? So it gets bigger, which would be great. Except, of course, that the third leaf was kind of this, like, DIY thing. So this one matched the other two, and it doesn't have anything to hold it in place, except, like, the pressure of the table being pushed together. So if you're not careful and you put a side dish that's, like, a little too heavy down at one end, it, like, it's, not, it's not good. And then once you get the third leaf kind of wedged in, of course, the beautiful edge work of this hand-me-down table is totally interrupted by this, like, sort of particle board. So you have to find the tablecloth to put on it, right? So it looks okay. But there's only one tablecloth that fits the table at this length, right? And I have no idea. <laughs> uh, maybe you added an extra table this year, the much sought after kids' table, where little ones and some of their rowdier adult companions might be placed. Thanksgivings, as a child, my great aunt Thelma um, had a table that was not big enough for everyone, so it was milk drinkers in the kitchen with the kids around a card table. 
with folding chairs. This had been a tradition since my dad was a child, um, going to his Aunt Thelma's house for Thanksgiving. And so when my mom and dad got married, the first time they hosted a meal in their small new house, they, of course, didn't have room for everyone at their table, and they told Aunt Thelma, we're so sorry, milk drinkers in the basement, <laughs> where they had set a single table with a place for just for <laughs> They didn't make her eat down there, but it was, you know, just a good joke. Um, gathering at a table is one way to describe what we do here in this place. At least once a month we gather physically around Christ's table. We are literally called to this table in the act of communion. And I can't help but wonder if Jesus invited us to Thanksgiving, what would his table be like? Our first reading today from Jeremiah gives us one view of Christ's table. This is a royal table, a table that David sits at, a table where the leaves all definitely match and the linens are impeccably clean. It is a table for a king, which is appropriate on this Sunday, marked in the liturgical calendar as the reign of Christ, or Christ the King Sunday. This table is an extravagant table. Think royal wedding. There is caviar and foie gras and is that Jesus popping up on the crystal? I don't know about you, but when I consider this table, I start to get a little bit anxious. I'm not sure I belong there. I, I definitely wouldn't know which fork to use. Would I even have the right outfit to wear? Would I be welcome? Would I be good enough even to be invited? This royal table is not the only story. Another traditional reading on Christ the King Sunday from the Gospel of Luke is the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Quite a different view of what Jesus' table might be like. This is a table packed full of sinners and outcasts and all of the wrong kinds of people. This table is a crucified table, a weak table. A table without the power to defend itself. What kind of king is that? Where's the crystal in this table? It's so unimaginably different from the table of Jeremiah that it's shocking. Not only do the leaves not match, there's a, a leg missing on this table, and good luck finding the tablecloth, let alone keeping your napkins after this band of untrustworthy people has gone through. Hide the silver. The, Jarring disparity of these two tables is much like the jarring disparity of people's hopes and the reality of the early church. The prophets foretold a Messiah, a king, who would rule with power and might, who would provide for the people, who would make them safe. A powerful person who would bring justice, whose very name would be righteousness. But what they got instead in this Messiah, this Jesus, the Christ, was someone who criticized the powerful, who was worried about the rich people, who consorted with all the wrong folks. Jesus didn't form the super PACs that were necessary to overthrow Caesar. He didn't even try. He built his constituency among ordinary people, the ones everybody else had given up on. He didn't care. He wasn't interested in any of the earthly measures of power or success. What Jesus did, instead of amassing power, was to kind of redefine what power meant. What he did instead of storing up wealth was love. And he loved so fiercely that he was killed for it. And so powerfully that people gathered by the thousands to hear him speak. And they felt in their deepest inner parts that this man was telling them the truth. Their worlds were turned upside down. Their whole way of understanding things had to be redefined. In Greco-Roman culture, at the time of Jesus, it was popular to think and understand the world in terms of dualisms, two options, diametrically opposed, absolutely separate. Things were either black or white, powerful or powerless, rich or poor, good or bad, hopeful or hopeless. We're still attached to this kind of thinking. People always have been. It makes it very easy to make sense of the world, to categorize life. The powerful were rich and good. The powerless were poor and bad. 
And in the midst of this kind of thinking, what Jesus did was revolutionary when he said that the powerless were good and to be honored. When he said that the rich would have a hard time getting into the kingdom of heaven. When the Messiah sat down with sinners and screwed the whole system up. And God loves that. Even though it is a lot more difficult for us. The early church, as it struggled to figure out how to follow God, was committed to living in these contradictions. The passage from Colossians that we heard this morning, it, it's believed to be an ancient prayer, one of the earliest prayers we have um, recorded from one of these early Christian communities. I want to read it again in, in a different translation, a little more poetic, that might get some of the hymn Murray out of it. It says, Christ is the invisible, the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ were created all things in heaven and on earth, everything visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, sovereignties, powers, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. Before anything was created, Christ existed and in Christ all things hold together. Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and so Christ is first in every way. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Christ God was pleased to reconcile all things, everything in heaven and everything on earth. When Christ made peace by dying on the cross. There's a lot of pressure in our lives. Especially, I feel, especially during the holidays to engage in this really dualistic thinking, to be either one or the other, and preferably to be happy, thankful, joy-filled, and worry-free. I mean, is it just me for my own person? Um, it can be exhausting to try to pretend that we are only one-sided, only that good side of things. We aren't simply one or the other. But you know what? Neither is our God. That's what sticks out to me from that early Christian hymn in Colossians. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from among the dead. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Last week we talked about the way that things fall apart. And today there is a word of good news for us. In Christ, all things hold together. In Christ, the fullness of God and creation dwells. Not just the good parts, not just the happy parts, but the fullness, the totality. Jesus himself is not either or. He is the firstborn of creation and the firstborn among the dead. The first thing to be and the first thing to be raised of not being. Christ inhabits every part of our lives, the mountaintops of life and the valleys where death's shadows linger. Christ is both the king at Royal David's table popping champagne and the king crucified, powerless and weak by every standard of this world. At Christ's table there is no dichotomy that pressures us to choose one or the other. Instead, the two sides mix and mingle, while leopards eat filet mignon and hedge fund managers sit with undocumented children. Instead of creating confusion, removing the choice between either this or that, opens this beautiful space of freedom to be, maybe to be made new. <clears throat> As it was for those early followers of Jesus, when we encounter the all-encompassing love of Christ, the one in whom everything dwells, in whom all is reconciled, in whom all are set free, it turns our worlds upside down. The way we see and understand things, including even our expectations for ourselves and others, all of it changes. We find ourselves at Christ's table, where the linens don't have to match, things don't have to be perfect, we don't have to be perfect, because Christ has already made us that way. All are welcome at Christ's table. All are safely gathered in. 
This is what's really beautiful to me about our life of faith. Jesus listens to our thankfulness as he listens also to our worries, our frustrations, and our fears. In this holiday time, amidst all the pressure to be shiny, happy, joy-filled, grateful, we are not limited to dualistic thinking or being. We carry within us both joy and sorrow, gratitude and frustration, and however we feel imperfect as we are, it is just the way that God calls us to come to our messy, disorganized, haphazard, and beautiful table. For this, we can be grateful. Friends, will you join me in singing a song about being gathered to this table? Gather us in number 640. You may be seated. Uh, except if you are uh, Kevin, Jocelyn, Sharon, or Ari. In that case, would you please come to the front? We have a major reason to be thankful this morning, and it is this group of new members. Woo! On behalf of the session, I present Ariana De Siero, who has been received into the membership of this congregation by transfer from <laughs> And on behalf of the session, I present Charlene Bourgeois, Jocelyn O'Brien, and Kevin O'Brien, who have been received into membership of this congregation by reaffirmation of faith. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God, and we rejoice in the gifts that you bring us. Yeah. <laughs> um, Galatians 3 says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Sisters and brothers in Christ, our baptism, is the sign and seal of our cleansing from sin and of our being grafted into Christ. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken and God's kingdom entered our world. Through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. Let us celebrate that freedom and redemption through the renewal of the promises made at our baptism. So I'll ask you once again to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, I do. Amen. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will with God's help. You have publicly professed your faith. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship, continue to share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will with God's help. Members of this congregation, in receiving these new members, do you promise before God and before them to give them your love and encouragement that they may grow in their Christian life and commitment? If so, say, we do. We do. If there are any deacons or elders who would like to come, I know like everyone's a deacon and elder, there's anyone who would like to just come place a hand on a shoulder up here to show these people that they really are surrounded by love and care. <laughs> Thank you to those servings. That was great. <laughs> All right, let's pray. 
Holy God, we praise you for gathering us into the body of Christ. In all of our diversity and variety, you make us one. Teach us to love one another. We thank you for adding to our number these brothers and sisters in faith. Guard them with your protecting hand and let your Holy Spirit be with them forever. Lead them to know your word, your peace, your love, your mercy, that they may serve you in this life and dwell with you forever. Amen. 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 So a big welcome to Ari Kevin Jackson.